in order to capture the atmosphere and grand scale of the world created by J.R.R. Tolkien, the game development team took painstaking measures to deliver an authentic online recreation of a living, breathing Middle Earth. Well, certainly one of our biggest challenges is taking what is, depending on the version you have, 1,400 pages of text and translating that to an immersive world and to an interactive game. And um, that's very challenging, you know, for a lot of reasons. It's challenging because, you know, the great thing about a book is that everybody has their own vision of what their reading looks like. So the first thing is identifying what are the commonalities? What are things that pretty much anyone who reads the book is going to come to expect? How do we create a world in which you do what a gamer wants to do, which is explore and interact with this world and with this story, and at the same time, make sure that it feels like it's in the world, in the time, in the story that you come to expect. So when we are reading through the books and we're looking at all the literature and you know doing our research, there are so many kinds of cues in the text itself for how we build this world. Tolkien has created the most detailed, rich, deeply described place in existence that doesn't actually exist, you know, to the point that it really feels like it exists. We have this this huge, huge place with tons of richness and depth that we wanted to explore for years and years to come, you know, with our community. What we did is decide on the lands of Eriador, which is really where um, the Fellowship spends most of their time in the first books. Everything that we do starts from what did Tolkien write, what world did he create, what was his intention behind creating that world. And we make sure that whenever we're in places that were specifically described by Tolkien in the books, that we're representing them in a way that's true to his vision of what that particular place looked like. If you really look at Tolkien and why is that story the most popular fantasy of all time, it's a lot because the world he tried to create is one that's believable. That's under everything that we do, so that when you're walking around our Middle Earth, it feels like a real place. It's familiar to you, not just because you recognize it from the books, but because it feels a lot like the world that you experience day to day. But it's got this extra sort of expansive enhancement to it. There's a lot of places that people are gonna recognize, very famous landmarks from the books that you're gonna see Early on, you're going to be at the Prancing Pony, which is um, in Breland and where Strider and um, the Hobbits first meet. You're going to be at the top of Weathertop, having your own encounter with Black Riders and Wraiths the same way that Aragorn does. You're going to end up in Rivendell at Elrond's house, and you're going to explore that house. You'll go to the Barrow Downs, and in fact, go deep into the Great Barrows, which are described in quite a bit of detail in the books. You'll go to Tom Bombadil's house in the edge of the Old Forest. There are a lot of sort of iconic representation of places that are well known from the books. One of the things that's been great in working with Tolkien Enterprises is that they've really given us freedom to expand on the lore and expand on what Tolkien wrote. The biggest example of this is Angmar and all the areas inside of Angmar. What would happen if, you know, the Witch King basically created Angmar again and rose this to power? So we were able to create Karn Doom, which is something which is just briefly mentioned, a huge palace fortress, you know, evil fortress in, in Angmar. What does Angmar look like? Nobody really knows. And you know, he talks about what Angmar did. He talks about the evil that comes from there, but he didn't describe it. So we decided Angmar should be dark, jaggy, obsidian with lots of angles and, you know, very ominous and different looking than anywhere else in Middle Earth. And we were able to pretty much create that from scratch. But it's a place that did exist. The tools that the world builders have to work with um, are, are instrumental, really. We couldn't do what we do without it. World Builder is a great tool. It allows us to do basically everything we need to build uh, the Lord of the Rings online, to put this world together. Um, we can manipulate the height map on the fly. We can paint terrain textures. We can place assets. We can place game content. We can adjust time of day. We can set up animations or um, starting idle animations. So when you go into a monster camp, a drake isn't just standing there. He's actually chewing down on his latest catch that he found off in the fields. We actually have real constellations off in our night sky. And so because the tool is so robust, it's allowed us to efficiently create a game of this scale to a high level of quality.
So for a game of this complexity, and especially something where we are working with iconography that you know is so recognizable to people who've read the books, it's even more important for us to really have a clear picture of where we're headed before we go build any part of the world. Now, concept art is important for any kind of you know game design that's very graphic intensive and certainly places that rely on a large, large landscape like this. Um, for us, it's been absolutely essential because it's where that translation interpretation happens between what is in the books and what we're actually going to build in the game environment that we're creating. And what we want to be able to do is have the experimentation happen on paper. And there's flexibility in the concept art that gives us ability to play with not only structurally how it looks, but what's the, the mood, what's the tone of this area. We need you to draw Rivendell. And, uh, all we know is that water elements are really important. It needs to be magical and beautiful and gorgeous and lush. The rest, up to you. It gives us one thing to focus on um, that we can all circle around to end up where we think we're headed for that particular area. And then that becomes the blueprint for all the work that comes after that and actually bringing that to life. We have some unbelievably talented concept artists here. Um, they have somehow encapsulated the spirit of what Tolkien was describing in terms of tone and architecture. The history of Middle Earth, which you know we filled their brains with all kinds of things about the way the architecture would be, and then their own um, investigation of how things looked in you know, England and in other pastoral places around the world in, that Tolkien would have drawn from. Every one of our concept art pieces that we use, you know, mechanically to build the game is really something that's a piece of fine art that you could hang on the wall. In fact, we do that here. There's a gallery in the studio here where uh, we line the walls with the art that's been drawn by some of these concept artists and other artists in the building. I mean, it's just unbelievably detailed, phenomenal work. We think we've built uh, the richest online world that has ever existed, you know, and we feel like um, this has always been a goal for us um, because to not do that for Middle Earth would be a huge lost opportunity. So as a player's walking through our recreation of Middle Earth, I'd really like them to think that we got it right. The Lord of the Rings Online Shadows of Angmar offers you the chance to truly experience the grand fantasy world created by J.R.R. Tolkien to move through the world of Middle-earth freely and to join the free peoples as they face the shadows of evil that threaten to engulf the world.